The Old Testament lesson for this, the 22nd Sunday after Pentecost, is from the prophet Jeremiah, the 31st chapter. Thus says the Lord, Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among the blind and the lame, the pregnant women, woman and she who is in labor together. A great company, they shall return here. With weeping, they shall come. And with pleas for mercy, I will lead them back. I will make them walk by the brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Here ends the reading. The epistle is from the letter to the Hebrews, the seventh chapter. The former priests were many in number, because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently, because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins, and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath which came later than the law appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Here ends our reading. Please stand. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. They came to Jericho, and as Jesus was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and to say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed Jesus on the way. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to thee, O Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear the words of Jesus. Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed Jesus on the way. The difference in Christ oftentimes, uh, especially in the scripture, but frequently also in life, uh, we better understand things through a contrast. You can take one thing and you can better understand the opposite, right? Um, To a blind person, right? You can describe light by describing uh, the warmth that comes from it. And you can describe shadows as the lack of that warmth. 
The contrasts that we draw, that we paint in front of us, are helpful because they help us to say, this is this thing, and it is not that thing. Right? All the way back to when we are children. When we were raising our children, we experienced this because we would ask, you know, uh, uh, do you remember the old uh, the, the barnyard thing where you, you pull down the thing and it spins around? The cow says, moo, right? We all remember the little spinner deal. And so we would joke with our kids and we would say things like, the cat says moo. And, and they knew right from the start, they knew, no, that's, that's not it. That's not in the category of cat sounds. They say meow. They don't say moo. You're thinking of a cow, mom and dad. Why are you so silly? We have that in front of us in our text today. We really and truly do. If you look in light of the last two weeks' texts, because we're still in the same chapter, just like Mark chapter 9 took us several weeks to get through uh, here in these later weeks of the season of Pentecost when we are just marching straight through the uh, chapters dealing with Jesus' teachings and his miracles. But here in Mark chapter 10, we are likewise in a long chapter. And I would remind you that Mark chapter 10, we've already seen the great contrast from this man, Bartimaeus, the rich young ruler. I know I talked about him last week, and that was to make the point that Jesus was further um, elucidating and, and examining. The uh, point is that it's difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's difficult for anyone to enter the kingdom of heaven of their own volition, of their own will. Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a person who has wealth to enter the kingdom of heaven. But here in the very next verses, Jesus again is making his way from Jericho up towards Jerusalem. And as he goes, there is this man, this blind beggar, we are told, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. We know already more about this man than we ever got to know about the rich young ruler. This man has a name. This man has a family. This man has a disability. And this man has, I guess you could even call it an occupation. He is Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. He is a blind beggar, sitting by the roadside as Jesus walks in to Jericho. And he heard that Jesus was coming to town. And he makes a good confession. You'll remember the rich young ruler. He, he shouted out to Jesus. He came to Jesus with all of his pomp and his majesty, with all of his importance. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus was a bit taken aback by that kind of a greeting. And Jesus had said to him, he had said, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Jesus basically doubles down, as I told you last week. Jesus says, hey, do you really mean what you're saying? Are you really calling me good teacher, that is, the God teacher, the one who came from God to be your teacher, or do you just mean to flatter me? Turns out it was the latter, because the very next time that the rich young man opens his mouth, no more of that good teacher business, now just... Uh, teacher, I have done all of these commandments that you have commanded since my youth. Teacher, not good teacher. Won't make that mistake twice. And then Jesus tells the man. He says, one thing yet you are lacking. Jesus keeps pushing because the man feels like he has justified himself. He feels like he has saved himself. He's, he's done enough to satisfy God's righteous requirement. But if you're going to get to heaven... By what you do, well, the goalposts will never stop moving. You think that you've kept the commandments. You think you've kept the law. You think you've done all of these things even since your youth. Well, Jesus says, one thing still do you lack. Go and sell all that you have. Give it to the poor. Come and follow me and you will have riches in heaven. And the man walked away tearful. The man walked away the pages of scripture into the pages of being forgotten and only remembered as a cautionary tale not to fall in love with this world's riches. But not Bartimaeus. Not Bartimaeus because Bartimaeus understands how to read the room. He sees what's going on as he is a blind man, ironically. Jesus is walking by and he knows that Jesus of Nazareth is the one who is the son of David. 
which is not something that you can learn. It's something that the Holy Spirit reveals to you. This is a statement of faith. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. How much more different from the rich young man's greeting to Jesus could this be? He doesn't bring anything to him. Good teacher, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to inherit eternal life instead? Bartimaeus says, I know you. Jesus, whose name means God saves his people. The one who saves his people, Jesus, you are the son of David. I suppose that if he had a few more words to speak in the spirit here, he might have even said, you are the son of David and yet David's Lord. Have mercy on me. Nothing does he bring in his hands. Nothing does he bring saying, Jesus, I really deserve a miracle this morning. He simply says, have mercy on me. Give me what I don't deserve. What a beautiful statement. Many were rebuking him, and that happens, by the way, when you have the faith of Bartimaeus and the faith that Jesus calls us to be a part of. The world on the outside, uh, your family, perhaps even people that are here in this church, will say, how can you have faith like that? It's one thing to believe in Jesus, but friend, you got to do some of the work too. You gotta, you gotta believe like it's all on Jesus, and you gotta live out your life like it's all on you. You gotta work harder, you gotta work smarter, you gotta do all of the things so that you can get ahead in this life. Because after all, you deserve to have a nice life, right? And the world has set a standard of what a nice life is. The world has told us this is how you go out and you get that thing. It causes us to get involved in all sorts of arguments, all sorts of strife, all sorts of discord. Because sometimes we get involved in the mud fight as well. And yet the faith that Jesus calls us to be a part of is the faith of Bartimaeus. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. That prayer, have mercy on me, is one that we will be praying, we will be singing in just a few moments in our matin service. You hear it each and every Sunday here at Holy Cross Lutheran Church, uh, whether we're in page 5, page 15, matins, it's even in our evening services that are coming up during the season of Advent. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. They call it the Kyrie. It's Latin. Kyrie means Lord. The longer word is Kyrie eleison, which means Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy upon me. That is the prayer of the faithful. We talked just a moment ago with the children about the fact that prayer is a habit. And the times when our habits of prayer come out most uh, most obviously, are when something terrible or something wonderful happens. When something terrible happens, do we take the, the Lord's name in vain? Do we utter a vulgarity or even a curse? Or do we say, Lord, have mercy? You know, that's one of those prayers that sometimes we just kind of call a shot in the dark prayer. I don't know exactly what needs to happen. I don't know how God is going to fix this situation. I don't know how God is going to turn this evil, this wickedness, this brokenness into good. But Lord, have mercy. Because dear friends, the truth is that he does. That's one of the things that is most beautiful about the, the organization and the ordering of our divine service that we have on page 5 and page 15 is we, we pray, Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. We're crying out and saying, God, help us. And then the very next thing that we have in our liturgy is that we sing the Gloria in excelsis. We have on our very lips the song of the angels on the night when Jesus 
king of the world, the king of kings and lord of lords, took on flesh when he was born to come and to be our savior. Lord, have mercy, he does. And I hope that each and every time that you sing, Lord, have mercy upon us, Christ, have mercy upon us, Lord, have mercy upon us, your faith, it echoes, it reverberates back that there is an answer. Glory be to God on high and on earth peace to men. Yes, God has had mercy. God has sent forth his son. And that's exactly what happens here in our uh, gospel lesson. There are those rebuking the man, Bartimaeus. They're telling him to be silent. And he keeps crying out. Can you just hear him? Crying out in this crowd over all of the naysayers, over all of the people that are saying, just give Jesus a minute, right? Leave Jesus alone. But he keeps crying out, son of David, son of David, have mercy on me. And then Jesus says, call him here. They call him up to Jesus. Take heart. They say to Bartimaeus, he is calling you. He throws off his cloak. No more is he going to be under that dirty, dingy cloak. He springs up. Can't you see it now? He jumps forward to find Jesus. And Jesus asks him that simple question, what do you want me to do for you today? How can I help you today? What does mercy look like for you today? The man says to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. That's what mercy looks like. And perhaps uh, Bartimaeus knows his scriptures well. And so he's reciting from memory that idea from, from Isaiah's prophecy. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, the recovery of sight to the blind. Or maybe this is just a shot in the dark prayer. Lord, have mercy. What does that mercy look like? Let me have my sight. And Jesus says, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Another thing I want you to notice here. With the rich young man, Jesus said, go sell all that you have. Give it to the poor. And you come, follow me. And the man would not. Contrast that. With Bartimaeus, Jesus says, go on your way. Your faith has made you well. Jesus says, go where you're supposed to be. Get out of here. It's already taken care of. And immediately he recovers his sight. But what does he do? He doesn't go on his way. He follows Jesus on Jesus' way. Your friends, that's what faith looks like. It's that shot in the dark prayer. It's that that cry out to God in the midst of angst, in the midst of turmoil that says, Lord, have mercy because I don't know what to do or where to go or how this turns out good. And then after we sing and say and pray, Lord, have mercy, we follow up by following Jesus because we know who Jesus is. We can call him good teacher and he would say, only God is good and we would still call him good teacher. That's why we aren't just a nameless, faceless crowd. That's why we don't leave this place disheartened and weeping. You see, Jesus knows each one of us by name. He knows each one of us by our poverty of spirit. He knows each one of us by our brokenness and he restores it. All of the Bartimaeuses in this congregation and in the Christian church We know what kind of a Jesus we have. Let's not forget it. Because he calls us, he calls us to be people who are broken down. People who are broken down by the world, but built up by him. The very next verses of this uh, this gospel, this is the end of the chapter. The very next verses, Jesus makes his triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. This is the last thing that Jesus does before he enters Jerusalem for the final time. Jesus goes and he calls somebody who he knows by name, Bartimaeus, this blind beggar, son of Timaeus. Now he's a son of God. Now he's a child of the kingdom. Now he sees and now he knows the mercy of Jesus. So do you. So do I. Today, your mercy calls us to wash away our sins. That's why we are here this day. That's why we keep coming back. 
because the mercy of Jesus knows no ends. And we know that we keep going back to these, those same old sins that we hate, that we can't stand, that we say, Lord, I hate the, the evil, the wicked that is within me. I want rescue. I want respite. And he just keeps calling us back. He keeps saying, y'all come. Because this is the place where his mercy is poured out, where his grace knows no bounds, where his forgiveness is yours and mine forever. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, it will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord until he comes again. Lord, have mercy. Amen.